Hey everyone, Steve here with Phantom History. Thanks so much for checking us out on YouTube, and if you enjoy our content, make sure you subscribe. I also wanted to remind you that Patreon subscribers get access to bonus content, and we have a newsletter that you can subscribe to that will let you know when a new episode drops and when that new bonus content is available. Enjoy this episode. It was just one word, a name, that caught the attention of the Genesis Paranormal Services team. After spending hours, if not days, listening to and watching footage they had captured during a recent investigation at the Tampa Theater in downtown Tampa, the name James was heard on a video camera that was left to record in the empty historic lobby. The name, according to the group's director, Jeremy Reddig, didn't connect to anything else the team had collected, nor did it seem to tie into any historic person or haunting that they had heard of before. But very clearly, on the footage showing nothing but an empty room, James is distinctly heard in a whisper. Jeremy is convinced that this is an EVP, or electric voice phenomena. Later, when the entire team was reassembled, the footage was brought up in conversation, and one member of the team, Travis, was especially interested in hearing the EVP for himself. Once he heard it, he was stunned, but not because the equipment caught what had to be the voice of a spirit trying to communicate, but because of the name that it shared, James. Travis is my middle name, he told the group, who had only ever known him by that one name. James, he added, is my first name. I'm Steve Blanchard. Welcome to Phantom History. The Tampa Theater, as shared in the previous podcast, prides itself as one of the most, if not the most, haunted buildings in Tampa. The theater has been in continuous use for more than nine decades and has played host to thousands upon thousands of guests performers, employees, and volunteers. A place so heavily trafficked and so beloved seems to possess the right combination of, well, something, to lure spirits to spend the afterlife within its walls. Tampa Theater Marketing Director Jill Witecki believes most of the spirits at the Tampa Theater are there by choice and that they have a tie to the history of the building in some way. But there's one spirit there that seems out of place in the renovated building. Jill doesn't know her identity and simply refers to her as the Lady in White. Back before Tampa Theater was here, and again, we were built in 1926. So previous to that, when Franklin and Polk were dirt roads, that a young woman was struck by a carriage and killed out in the street near where the theater is. Over the years, uh, that has been one of only two instances where we have had people claim to actually see apparitions in the building. Uh, people have claimed to see a woman in a long dress walking up and down the mezzanine hallway um, outside the balcony. Um, we had one volunteer for a while who claimed she saw her every time she walked in the building. Uh, she did claim to see her several times and others have claimed to see uh, the, the appearance of a woman as well. Not knowing a lot about the history, not having ever found any hard corroborating evidence that there was indeed a woman killed outside. Again, I've always been just a little bit skeptical of that story and, and all the pieces, um, but the same sensitive that saw all of the entities come down when the organ started playing was walking through the building um, during one of their investigations. And of course, uh, as, as Jeremy explained to me, the whole idea is to bring these people into the building cold. They don't know the stories, they don't know what they're walking into, um, and we're looking for them to um, basically give us information that, that corroborates what we already think we know. And so when, when she was coming through the building, um, one of the places that she stopped 
was right at the the balcony doors into the auditorium. So in between the lobby and the auditorium on the second floor. The same spot where we had a previous employee uh, back in early 2000s see a concrete urn appear to move when she was doing her closing duties at the end of the night in the building. She saw there's an urn that sits outside the door that she thought was rocking. Um, and again, this is one of the stories that had been passed down to me. I finally got the opportunity to talk to the employee right. a couple of months ago and hear the story from her own mouth. Um, and, and she says, absolutely. That thing was rocking back and forth and it's made of cast concrete. So it's not going to just move on its own. Anyway, when the sensitive came through the building, she stopped in almost exactly that same spot and, and grabbed her stomach, doubled over. Um, and of course we were all saying, you know, what are you, what are you feeling? What are you seeing? And she said, there's a woman here who her mind is clear, but her body is wrecked. She has just undergone incredible trauma, um, but her mind is clear. She knows who she is, but she doesn't know where she is. She's confused. Um, and as she kept describing what she was feeling, she finally said, it's like she got hit by a truck. And so again, for us, that was enough to say, well, what about a carriage? The Lady in White is the, perhaps the most tragic spirit still lingering within the Tampa Theater, according to Jill. In fact, the Lady in White seems to be the only one there who isn't there by choice. The story of the woman in white is troublesome because it seems like of all the stories we tell, she may be the one who's not here by choice. She may be the one who somehow is trapped here or doesn't understand why she's here um, and, and hasn't had the opportunity to move on. Um, so selfishly, I, I wish she would stay here because it's a fun part of the story. Um, but again, I would also like to understand more about what actually happened and, and if she doesn't belong here, you know, maybe there's something we can do to, to make sure she gets where she's going. Jeremy says that while he does come from a religious background, there are no simple answers when it comes to helping someone or something cross over if it appears to be trapped within a building. He also believes that it's important for paranormal investigators to protect themselves, even if the entities they have encountered have not shown themselves to be malevolent. And so far, all of the spirits within the Tampa Theater appear friendly. Well, there are different practices that can quote unquote help a spirit move on. You know, the what I where I learned from, I, I also come from a religious background, uh, non-denominational Christian, and um, my my beliefs do tie in to my way of investigating. And um, you know, I even protect myself because at the end of the day, we don't know what we're dealing with or who we could come in contact with. We've been investigating the theater for six years and not experienced anything malevolent or awful or evil here. But there's definitely some things going on, you know, that's, that suggests that there is an inhabitant here that's, you know, ethereal. While there is plenty of mystery surrounding the tragic woman in white, there are other entities lingering at the Tampa Theater who are somewhat easier to identify. At the beginning of tours and at the beginning of paranormal investigations, one entity constantly seems to make itself known quite early. The punctuality reflected by the spirit leads investigators and employees at the theater to believe that is none other than a beloved employee from the 1950s, who just so happens to be the only person known to have died within the Tampa Theater. Robert Lanier was a ticket taker for us in retirement. He had spent a, a career as an engineer and then came to Tampa Theater in his retirement to be a ticket taker. And Robert was known among our patrons and his coworkers for having a little bit of a shtick. He would spin around, uh, take your ticket, spin around as he tore it, click his heels and hand you back your ticket stub. So he had a little bit of a flair and everybody knew who Robert was because of it. Well, again, Robert was the only one to die in this building and he died on a Friday around noon. So the building was open, there were other people here, his co-workers were here, but none of them were in the lobby with him. And according to a story in the Tampa Tribune the following day, some of his co-workers heard a crash. Um, one of them described it like a sign falling. And they all came running to the lobby and found Robert 
um, bleeding profusely from a head wound out onto the tiles of the lobby. According to one of the hospital reports, uh, again quoted in the newspaper, it looked like he had been beaten up. So all these years later, we're actually fortunate to know Robert's granddaughter and great-grandson. They still live in the area. They have visited the theater. They have told us what they know about the story. And what we all agree on is that nobody really knows what happened. Um, Friday was a payday and his check was never found. So there is a chance that he was robbed for his paycheck, that somebody may have come in off the street and attacked him in the lobby. He may have fallen, he may have tripped over something, fallen down the stairs, you know, tripped over his own feet, practicing his spin and hit his head on the tile. Um, but, but he was the only death since this has been Tampa Theater property. And it's been our experience with Jeremy and his team that when we're investigating the building, um, Robert tends to be active at the beginning of investigations and at the beginnings of tours. And then when we come back later in the tour, later in the investigation, um, we don't pick up as much. So that, again, would make sense that he would have been there at the beginnings of shows, at the beginnings of tours, and then would move elsewhere in the building to, to tend to other duties while the show was going on. It seems Robert specifically likes to communicate through EMFs, or electromagnetic frequency detectors, and through EVPs. And it was near his post in the lobby that the paranormal investigative team picked up one of their most striking EVPs, which stated the name mentioned at the beginning of this episode. Jeremy explains the EVP in full and why they believe that it's the voice of a man who died more than 60 years ago. It was, it was the name. It just said James. There was a whisper. It was clear as day. No correlation to why it would say that. What was interesting we had split up into teams and we had main locations where we spent most of our, our time. The, ins the investigator that I had in there does a really good job. His name is Travis. Travis wasn't part of the evidence review, so he didn't know at the time that we had actually captured that piece of evidence. So when we were actually talking about it, we had everybody together. We, we said we caught this EVP on a, um, it was just a standalone camera that was just do, doing some filming in that area. And we, we got the name James and he looked at us and he's like, James, are you sure? I'm like, yeah, we let him listen. He goes, that's interesting. And we're like, why? He says, well, my middle name's Travis. My first name's James. And we didn't even know that was his first name. We've only, only known him as Travis. While the Tampa Theater is known as a movie palace, it also hosts a few live events on its somewhat small stage. The theater, you'll recall, opened in the mid-1920s, so this was before The Wizard of Oz became the mega-hit it is now back in 1939, and some of the theater's earliest films were silent films, accompanied only by a live organist. So while films were popular entertainment, they were new and competed, although very briefly, with the live vaudeville acts that toured the country. That explains why, hidden in the theater's basement, underneath the stage, there are two small dressing rooms. Jill suspects those are the areas where vaudeville performers could prepare for their shows. They are still used today, although sparingly, on the rare occasion that a comedian or some other performer takes to the Tampa Theater stage. But according to some of those performers, while they're getting ready, they realize that they may not be alone. So back in the 80s, I believe it was 86, we had Harry Anderson here who played uh, the judge on Night Court and he did a stand-up comedy routine. He was a magician and so he came through Tampa and did a set at Tampa Theater and was assigned one of the dressing rooms in the basement to get ready, dressing room number two. And according, I was not at the theater at the time, but according to the stories that were handed down to me, he wasn't in that room for 15 minutes when he said, it feels weird down here. I don't like it. It's, it's, I, I feel oogie. I want to be out of here. So they put him somewhere else in the building. We've never had any other claims down there until the same sensitive that felt the other things in the building was walking through that hallway. 
uh, and stopped in dressing room number two. And the basement is creepy. It's just creepy. And so the fact that she stopped in that room as opposed to anywhere else in the basement and started laughing, she goes, oh, you've got somebody in here. And we said, okay, tell us about him. And she goes, well, she goes, I'm gonna call him the trickster. He's wearing this big shitty grin on his face. He's not dangerous. He just wants to mess with people. He just wants to mess with you. And if you're trying to get ready in here, like, you know, hide your shoes before you go on stage, stuff like that. He just wants to mess with people. The sensitive wasn't able to identify the spirit and Jill hasn't found anything in her research that could help provide a name. But, based on what she has learned, she says that it isn't a stretch to link the spirit to the vaudevillian performers that once utilized the space underneath the stage. Jeremy says that getting more information through an investigation in that area is difficult, and that could be for several reasons. One, there are a lot of EMF sources underneath the stage, including electrical conduits. But there could be something else at play there, something that is much more difficult to identify, mostly because he believes it may not be an intelligent entity. There are a couple of different type of haunts or spirit activity. You know, you've got residual and you've got intelligent. Residual is, believe it or not, the most common. People think that intelligence is the most common, but it's actually residual. Residual is like a, a, a video or a tape that's being played back over and over again. It doesn't have any intelligence. It doesn't know that you're there. Um, there, are, there are residual sounds. It's somehow this, the earth has this natural ability to record certain points in time and then play it back over and over at certain points in time. You know, you've heard stories where people are walking down a hall, uh, you, they've seen a spirit walking down a hall and they would turn into uh, the wall just to vanish into the wall. And then later you, you learn through, you know, records that there used to be a door there. Very interesting things. Whereas intelligence suggests, well, just that, that it's, it, you know, it's letting you know that it's there. It's random. It'll tap you on the sho shoulder. It'll move items. You know, when you see an entity and it's grinning at you, waiting for you to come in, it's a, it's a suggestion of intelligence. Intelligence would also suggest that if it wants to be seen, it'll be seen. If it doesn't want to be seen, it won't be seen. Hence, that's why we haven't really caught anything that I just said. Whether residual or intelligent, it seems that something continues to attract paranormal activity to the Tampa Theater. In the last episode, Jeremy credited the upkeep of the historic venue and the energy of the building with attracting the spirits we discussed. And he may be correct. But Jill has another explanation, and this one is much more spiritual than paranormal. We had talked a little bit about why are these entities still here and why would a, an entity choose to haunt a building if it indeed is a choice. And what I've always told people, uh, you know, when I talk to them is that, you know, I'm, I'm a, a religious person. I was raised Catholic. I believe in an afterlife. And so it's a very short walk from believing in an afterlife to believing that there can be ghosts, there can be spirits that inhabit a building. And if we have any say at all as to how we spend the afterlife and what heaven is. You know, if there's a place that you love, that you felt comfortable, that you spent your time um, and, and you want to spend heaven in a beautiful movie palace watching shows and surrounded by people who are having fun all the time, that sounds like heaven to me. Since the extensive renovation in 2017, Jill maintains that the spiritual activity within the Tampa Theater has increased. Could it be that the disturbances made during the construction energize the entities that are there? Or could it be that the project, which returned the theater to its original look and feel, have created some form of spiritual nostalgia for those spending the afterlife within the comforting Mediterranean-style theater? Whatever the reason, both Jill and Jeremy are believers that several ghosts are enjoying the building and may do so for the extended future. But it may be this one final story that best describes the lore of the theater for those who are no longer with us, at least no longer with us on the physical plane. It's a story that most of us who have a favorite place to spend our spare time can relate to the most. It involves a lone theater attendee who appears, seemingly at random, near his favorite seat, 
and that is seat 308. Jill tells a story passed on from her predecessor at the theater, who shared that one day while walking through the back of the auditorium, she saw a man in a fedora sitting in one of the seats. She called out, and the man stood up, turned around, and looked at her before disappearing. So she went looking for him, went and got a flashlight, couldn't find anybody, couldn't find uh, where he might have walked out, went and asked at the box office if they had let anybody in, and they said no, so there was no finding this guy. Um, So the first time Jeremy and his team came and investigated the building, I asked them to please spend a little time focused on that area of the auditorium. We knew it was, you know, 10 to 15 rows back in that first section of the auditorium. And so they did. They set up a camera on the stage that could shoot back into the seats. Um, They had um, several different meters walking around that area of the building. And then we did do an EVP session. The first thing that they noticed pretty quickly is that in carrying an EMF meter down this one particular row of chairs, you know, they were going up and down the rows and there was a baseline in the room that was pretty standard. And then there was this one chair that every time they go over that seat, the EMF reading would spike. And the seats around it were all the baseline, you know, above it, on the floor, all the baseline, this one particular seat. And it was seat 308 um, in the J row of section 300 kept spiking on the EMF meter. So add on top of that, when they went back and looked at the video footage, there was a light anomaly in that row that seemed to come down the row and drop into the seat. As Scott was leading the EVP session, um, he was asking all kinds of questions of, you know, who are you? Why are you still here? What are you doing here? What's your name? Um, And leaving a little bit of silence after each one, got no answers to any of them on the tape. But right at the end of the session, he said, you know, we're not trying to get rid of you. We're just trying to prove you're here. And we're just here to help Tampa Theater. And so when we went back and listened to the tape, again, no answers through the rest of it, but at the very end of the recording, you hear Scott's voice say, we're just trying to help Tampa Theater. And then you hear this whisper right up on the microphone that says, I'm trying. The voice has not appeared during any other investigations since it whispered those words. But Jill finds comfort in knowing that whatever ethereal residents remain seem to have a similar mission as the living souls still working at the theater. And that mission is to continue the preservation of the historic building. Like modern theaters, the Tampa Theater has a schedule of showtimes on its webpage, www.tampatheater.org. And it also has a host of special events, including After Hours Ghost Tours and its always popular Nightmare on Franklin Street film series each October. Perhaps if you get a chance to visit for a film or a special event, you'll get a whiff of Foster Finley's cologne. Or maybe you'll hear the ring of the manager's keys on the second floor balcony. But remember, if you are in the auditorium and you see that fedora-wearing gentleman sitting nearby, he may or may not be a permanent resident of the theater. With so many documented cases of paranormal activity and evidence in photos and EVPs at the Tampa Theater, it really just might be the most haunted building in Tampa. Thank you to Jill Watecki of the Tampa Theater and Jeremy Reddig of Genis Paranormal Services for their participation in this interview. If you would like to see tour schedules and events at the Tampa Theater, visit tampatheater.org. And remember, theater is spelled with an R-E. If you would like to learn more about Genesis Paranormal Services, look them up on Facebook. Phantom History is written, produced, researched, and edited by me, Steve Blanchard. Music for this episode is provided by Shane Ivers of Silverman Sound. For photos of the theater and of this actual interview, visit phantomhistory.com or follow the podcast on Facebook and Instagram. And please leave me a review on whatever podcast platform you use to listen. If you have a location you'd like to see featured in this podcast, please email podcast at phantomhistory.com. And as always, thank you for listening. Hey! 
Hey, Steve here. Thanks so much for checking out that content. And before you go, I wanted to let you know that if you become a supporter of the podcast through Patreon, you'll gain access to bonus content. And if you subscribe to our newsletter at phantomhistory.com, we will let you know when that bonus content becomes available and when a new episode drops. And one more thing, I'm always looking for ideas for future episodes. So if you have an experience or a location you think that I should focus on, please let me know through the website or you can email me directly at podcast at phantomhistory.com.